Happy week. Today I have, today I have an award winner. I do. You've won so many awards for I do. I don't know where to put them. I, I, Glenn, Gay, Gaylord? Is yes. that your, really your you name? Heard me. You heard me. Gaylord. Gaylord. Yes, Mr. Gaylord. That's a great name. My dad was a doctor and his favorite saying was, when a patient demanded that they cure him, uh -huh. or them, you know, he would say, my name is Gaylord, not THE Lord. You heard it here he first. Was, he was a happy guy. He was a happy guy. <laughs> um, Glenn is a director, producer, and screenwriter. His credits include the feature film Eating Out 3, All You Can, All you can Eat, Leave It on the Floor. He wrote that one. Uh, Let's Be Friends. Don't Let's be lovers. Either. It sure. kind of sounds like that line from Chico's Angels. Uh, and I do. That one. I do. The award winning I do. That won so many awards. I was just doing my research as I do. Um, so many. So many. How yeah. many awards? How many festivals was that in? Um, well, each one would play in like 40 or 50 festivals around the world. You didn't go to all of them, did you? As many as I could. They're a blast. Really? What yeah. happens at a festival? Well, that's the gravy. That's the part that you, you know, live for when you get to go. And festivals usually are full houses versus just any movie theater on any given day. Yeah. And so you've got this big crowd, usually great projection, and people are enthusiastic, and they're happy you're there, and can, you know, there to answer questions. And so all that hard work is really, that, that's the gravy. It's really fun. And you learn a lot from different audiences. So if you travel around, you learn, oh, this audience likes this. This audience yeah. has no sense of humor. This audience taught me that that joke didn't work. You know, there's so much you learn. Oh, from people watching the film. Yeah. Or just not your, your, your charming personality. Well, that too, I would <laughs> hope. Oh, this is funny. I wrote, this is my question. I do, you won so many uh, film festival awards. What do you think resonated with the audiences with I Do? I do. Well, I do was made at a time before gay marriage was legalized, you know, before the Supreme Court yeah. uh, handed down their decision. And so it was at a time where, in this case, binational couples uh, couldn't live together. They couldn't be married if they were same sex couples. Mm -hmm. And this impacted my own family, where my stepsister had um, a wife from a different country and they couldn't live in the same country because of uh, the immigration rulings that. You know, gay marriage wasn't recognized, so therefore your spouse could not live in the same country as you if you were okay. different citizens. So I think that it resonated with people as this unfair system that was set up. And I think people really, you know, were, were able to relate to a character that just wanted to be with the person they wanted to be with. Mm. And what was the toughest thing to film on this movie? Toughest thing? Um, you know, we shot... Uh, even though the film was completely set in New York, yeah. uh, except for one sequence uh, at the end, uh, we shot most of it in L.A., but we did shoot a couple days in New York, and when we were shooting, we shot on the subway, which really not a lot to do. We just kind of snuck on there with a camera <laughs> that looked like a still photo camera and shot scenes. That was really tough, because it was we had to be very stealthy, very quick, communicate my sign language, yeah. and just kind of get it done really fast. And uh, it was at a time where the... Um, one the the the, uh, the the protesters were out in uh, against Wall Street. You know, oh wow! Remember the march against Wall Street? Yeah. Uh, they were out in full force, so we would shoot in Washington Square Park, and protesters descended on it just as we were shooting a scene. And uh, in in the background of one shot, you can actually see them marching towards us. Oh wow! If you look carefully. And the spoiler alert: most of us was shot here in L.A. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, you I did a really good job. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, David Gill was our cinematographer, and he and I worked really hard so that uh, you were fooled, and we yeah. it we cut together our footage from New York pretty well so that you really couldn't tell. But if you move that camera one inch, you're going to see a palm tree, <laughs> or 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 one of those tourist buses, <laughs> the, the half buses, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> all those people. We were just actually watching this. Uh, I had it on plane and. You told me a lot of great things that were happening. Yeah. The commentary. It's, it's definitely a great movie to watch. And, um... I mean, I might be interesting, but I'm no BJ Swallows. Hi, BJ! 
Hi, Big BJ. Fan. Big fan. Huge fan. Huge fan. <laughs> now, you directed I Do, uh -huh. but you wrote Leave It On The Floor. Correct. Now, I wasn't able to watch it, but the, the trailer kicks ass. I mean, I, I was like, what is going on? So, so how did you... Where where did Leave It On The Floor come from? So Leave It On The Floor, because uh, I'm the obvious choice to write an African-American <laughs> gay musical. <laughs> Thank about, God you said that, because I was... About the ball culture. But, you know, Ryan Murphy is doing it with Pose coming up, so, you know, okay. uh, I'm in good company. Um, Sheldon Larry um, is the director of the film, and he approached me, he had liked my writing, and asked me if I would be interested in doing a film with him, yeah. where he would direct and I would write, and... He approached me about a different subject, but then one night he just said, hey, do you know that movie Paris is Burning with the ball and the documentary, you know, the documentary about the ball culture in New yeah. York? Uh, I said, yeah. He goes, you know that's still going on. And I didn't. And so he took me to a ball, and I was really reluctant to write the film. I said, you know, I'm hardly the demographic to write this. Uh, he said, no, I like your writing, and you can really kind yeah. of sink into this world. And... Uh, we went to a ball and I was hooked, and I said, you know what, I think we have a musical here. And so, wrote it as a musical, so I wrote all the lyrics, I recorded a demo uh, with our friend Rebecca Cochin, okay. uh, of what I thought the song sounded like, and then uh, that, they, they weren't great. <laughs> they were very, very white, very, very white. And so, Sheldon put together a team, and part of that team was Kimberly Burse, who was Beyonce's music director. Mm. Um, and. Frank Gatson, who's Beyonce's choreographer, like on Single Ladies, on the video. Wow. And Beyonce's band recorded the, the, the music. And so and so Kim wrote all the music, and she used a couple of my yeah. tunes from the demo, actually, which I'm very thrilled with, um, and just elevated it and turned it into this kick-ass musical. There's 11 musical numbers in the film, and wow. I mean, this was shot on a shoestring, yet I'm so proud of it. it it's, uh, I mean... You know, and Beyonce was supposed to be in it, right? But but Miss Barbecue said, no, no, no. Beyonce was not supposed to be in it. Miss um, Barbecue owned that part. She 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 like, no Beyonce, I'm doing it. No, she's no. great. Uh, but uh, I'm very proud of that film. It's uh, it, it I mean, I get to say I wrote a musical. I mean, yeah, I love musicals, so that was really fun. And I wanted to write an unapologetic musical because so many film musicals. Um, set their musical moments on a stage so that it feels organic. And I'm like, no, no, no. can you swear on this? Yeah, you can do yeah, whatever you like, want. Fuck that. No, I want people to break out in song on a bus or in a bowling alley or on a rooftop, wherever they are. Because yeah. musicals are get inside the heads of characters and show you things that non musicals can't. You know, you're seeing the aspirations and their dreams come out that way. Yeah. And I love that part of it. I love the magic of that. I do too. But did you see The Greatest Showman? Yes. I heard it was not a true story. <laughs> I mean, it's hardly a searing biopic about no. P.T. Barnum, but it is, on its own terms, sweeping and gorgeous. Yeah. I was so taken by that film, yet I recognize that it's not particularly good. Yeah. It's great. It's, but the it's, music's really the good, The music too. and the way it's shot, the cinematography, the editing, everything comes together. It feels... Uh, like you're watching a trailer of the entire film because it just flows <laughs> like true. that. Uh, but hey, I, I think it's kind of magnificent. And if that ever comes on TV, I'm stopping what I'm doing and watching it each time because it, it's kind of that kind of yeah experience. My friend sent me somebody uh, s some online did online did a uh, like a real parody of the movie of like the real story, and they did all new music to it. So it like. It actually tells the story of what really happens. So there's like songs where P.T. Barnum is being abusive to people. Uh -huh. and, yeah. You know, well, it's good times. It's good times. Yeah, it's good times. It's not a documentary. <laughs> um, one of the other films you did, you filmed, was the third of the successful series of Eating Out. Mm -hmm. Eating Out 3. What was it? Eating, Eating Out. All You Can Eat. All You Can Eat. Bring a big appetite. You know, I'm a fan of the Eating Out series. Me too. Um, uh, they're not always the most... Um, they're just a lot of beautiful boys. It's raunchy. It's fun. It's just a, a good time. It's, they're mistaken identity farces. Yes. And they're just colorful pop confections they're, is what I think of them as. They're so fun. And 
What is her name again? She she wasn't she's been in most of them. Hasn't she's she? in all of them. There's been five. Rebecca Cochin is her name. Yes. And I met her when she was 17 years old. What? When she came out to LA. She was born in Vegas. She came out to LA to do the first Eating Out movie. Played Tiffany, and Tiffany is in all five of them. And uh, she and I are very 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 good friends. And I was so proud because she in this film has the largest role of all the films with yes. Tiffany in them. And we just had such a blast. It was so much fun because she can just make anything funny. Mm -hmm. She's just she's so talented. I'm thinking about the scene that I rewatched today on YouTube with the three boys on the couch and her outside, funneling her. Well, Jill, jilling off is the term. Oh, is it jilling off? Is that a word? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was petting the pussy, pussy cats outside. That uh, that's what she was doing. Banging um, her box. Wow. Bang in her box. Yeah. As the two boys are playing with everything else. Yeah, sadly, we lost one of our co stars, uh, Michael Walker, uh, last year. Uh, he played the straight guy that is Tiffany's. Oh, this one? Yeah, the that's middle? Tiffany's oh, ex boyfriend. Yeah, and so uh, he's no longer with us, and so I'm, I'm so proud of his performance, and he's in I Do as well. Oh. I don't think I got to him in I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this is. So, how was it going into a, a project that was. or a, a series that's already happened? Um, how did you approach going into doing a film like that that's already had a history? Right. Well, I, I was. Uh, Alan broke up with it. And uh, so, Alan always had this uh, idea that he wanted different people to direct sequels of the film. So, Philip Bartel, who edited all five of them and co wrote. Eating Out 2 through 5. Okay. Um, he directed the second one, uh, which was called Eating Out 2 Sloppy Seconds. And then I was approached by Alan and by Michael Scholl, the producer, to direct the third one. And uh, there was no way to say no. I mean, it was like, I, I love these films. Yeah. They were fun. This one had the extra bonus of having these two leads that had a sweet romance. So even though it's raunchy, there's this sweetness to it that reminded me of films like Sixteen Candles. And that yeah. it had that kind of innocence that I really like playing with, as well as just hitting you over the head with some crazy raunchy stuff as well. Just yeah. right in my wheelhouse. I really liked it. I liked it too. I don't know. Maybe because of all... How did you cast the boys? See, you're trying to make something very important and thespian into something salacious. It was a cast. They were they, it, these were people who came in, and to their credit, now so this is not the case with most auditions. Um, we had to shoot this film very fast. Yes. We shot it in eleven days, and wow. there was a lot of dialogue, and we had very little money to shoot. So these actors had to not only own their parts, but they yeah. had to do reams of dialogue every day, tons of it, and so. They knew coming into the audition phase that they had to show us that they could do that even at the audition phase. Because if people are tripping over their lines during an audition, you worry, are we going to be able to handle them on set? Are yeah. they going to delay us? And we would tell them, you're going to get like just a couple of takes to get 10 pages of dialogue out sometimes. And so they really rose to the challenge. You know, We never had a problem with the actors not knowing their lines. It was really yeah. quite miraculous. So. There's, there's a lot more talent involved than you think, even when you're making some raunchy. What? No, I was just thinking of some <laughs> raunchy stories on the set. Your pornorific question. What? Now, okay, I couldn't find anything on this, and I was so interested about this documentary you did called Camp Michael Jackson. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going clueless on this. Now, was this about Michael Jackson himself, or was this a documentary on, on, on something... I, 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 Something I, completely different than that. Yeah. It, so was it really? Yeah. Okay. So, because I wasn't really sure. Yeah. I mean, Michael Jackson factors heavily in it, but uh, Alan Broco, who created the Eating Out series, he mm -hmm. and I co-directed this, and it was a documentary about the fans who congregated in Santa Maria during Michael Jackson's sexual molestation trial. Oh and wow! These were fans that came in from all over the world to support their hero. Yeah. And who they felt was being um, unfairly profiled and that their cause was being different isn't a crime and that they they thought that because of his being different or being perceived to be a freak that people were easily able to make that leap to molest molestation yeah and so they had this very specific cause they weren't just autograph hounds and their passion was very palpable when we were making it and it was a fascinating time i mean watching 
the trial every day, watching the fans, watching Michael's relationships with the fans, where he, despite everything that terrible that was going on during that time for him, and he was clearly drugged up quite a bit. Yeah. He loved his fans, and he really paid attention to them. And his super fans, he knew them all. He had relationships with them as far as you know, social relationships. He invited them over for movie nights. He knew them by name. Mm. And so th there was a lot of love there. Um, and despite whatever you think about what he did or didn't do. And it was fascinating to watch these people who gave up what they were doing in their life to be there for months on end. Wow. that trial lasted five months. It did. Yeah. It did. That was a long trial. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, where can people see that? Well, World of Wonder produced it. So Ru World of Wonder is best known for producing RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah. Uh, if, so if you go to their website, worldofwonder.net, I think it's available through Amazon for renting. Uh, okay. It was made originally for British television, Sky TV, that World of Wonder partnered with. And it aired initially in England. Yeah. Uh, as, and it aired actually while the trial was still going on. And we just continued to shoot after it aired. Wow! Uh, for an American version that never came never to pass. Happened. No, but uh, it's it's really cool. It's a really cool documentary, and it's straight up documentary. You're not like these manipulated documentaries mm. where they're heavily produced. Yeah. We were following people and hoping things would happen, and they did. And they did. And they did. <laughs> they did. Um, Lesbian friends. I, was that a TV thing going on? How, what was that, or was that an internet uh, tele, television show with uh, Perez Hilton? Or no, no, Perez Hilton's a completely different project. Oh, really? Yeah. No, so I, I thanks um, IMDb. <laughs> no, what Perez says was the Perez Hilton show that I was a producer director on. Okay, uh, and that was another World of Wonder production. It was for VH1. It was a magazine style show of him interviewing tons and tons of celebrities. Okay, it was kind of a blast. Uh, no, Lesbian Friends was a sitcom pilot and an episode one of a sitcom that I wrote and directed. Uh, and if you've ever seen Three's Company or know the premise, no, I've never seen it. <laughs> you you know nothing about seventies. <laughs> nothing about seventies. Clearly, no, clear. Uh, but uh, Three's Company, the premise was I'm only twenty one. You have a straight guy pretending to be gay to live with these two women, or else the landlord would kick him out because it's. You know, that's not what your show is about. No, that's what Three's Company. Oh, that's Three's Company. That's I'm a great show. You should right. do that. <laughs> it's a great premise. Great premise. So, guy pretending to be gay so he could live with two women, or else the landlord would kick him out because straight guys can't live with straight women. No, back in the '70s, they can't. So, Lesbian Friends takes that premise and inverts it, and it sets it in 1969, the day after the Stonewall riots in Greenwich Village, at the Stonewall Bar, and you have a butch lesbian pretending to be a femi straight girl in order to live with her two gay roommates or else the lesbian hating landlord would kick her out and so that sounds good yeah it's fun and uh, robert michael morris who was mickey on the comeback the hairdresser mm -hmm. lisa kudrow's hairdresser yeah. that when that show first aired and got canceled after a season i didn't know him from adam yet i loved him on that show so much that i wrote the role for him and I said, I'm so upset that your show got canceled. I wrote him a letter to his agent. Mm -hmm. I'm so upset that the show got canceled. I just want to see you act again. I wrote something for you. And he took it and did it. I mean, he wow. plays the landlord, and he's amazing. And uh, unfortunately, we lost him last year as well. Oh, wow. um, he passed away, and he got to go come back to the comeback nine years later, and they did season two a year and a half ago. Wow. And uh, so... Uh, it was one of the honors of my life to work with someone who I thought was so tremendously talented and he just brought everybody's game up and so we shot the pilot and the first episode to, it, with the attempt to sell it as a series and it still might happen so look out for Lesbian Friends. It sounds good. It sounds good. Now, do you have a website? Where can people find you? I have several. <laughs> Tell them all! <laughs> They're writing it down now. Get it back. Okay, so um, I have my writer, director, filmmaker website, right? Just, just Google my name, Glenn Gaylord, uh, filmmaker, you'll find it. It's, it's two N's. Two M's in Glenn Gaylord, exactly how it sounds, folks. <laughs> um, your audience knows how to spell gay, right? No. Okay. Mm, well, well mm, only on Fridays, Saturdays. Well, look it up. <laughs> and, uh, and I also write film reviews. I write reviews of every film that I see, and it's on Tumblr. And I do not show dick pics on Tumblr. I write film reviews. And it's called Glenn on Film, with two N's again. Like, do you remember Men on Film from Living, mm -hmm. Living Color? This is Glenn on Film. He is a one talented person. Just <laughs> smart. I love writing talented, reviews of everything I see. Have an eye. Yeah, it's a blast to do that. So, um, I have a couple quick questions now that we, everybody knows where they can pick you up. I mean, 
look up your stuff. Ooh. Um, there's no way out of this. No, there's none. There's none. <laughs> Who would you most want to work with? And anybody to pick anything in the world. Who would you want to work with? Wow, that's a that is not a quick question. The the person the the, the actor that I'd love to work with of all of them is Deborah Winger. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually did get to work with her just in a different capacity. Um, fresh out of film school, I was a production assistant during post production on Terms of Endearment. My very first what? film. This was a big, giant, best picture winner. Oh my god! And I would have to go to Greenblatt's Deli and get Kreplock soup and cheeseburgers for Deborah Winger while she was doing her looping on the film. And so it was a great honor. I mean, she's from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. And so there was like this quick little rapport that we had. And I just love her. I think she's amazing. One of the best actors alive. She is. She was Wonder Girl. I loved her on Wonder Woman. Yeah. I'm also very fond of Charlize Theron. Is it Theron or Theron? How I don't know. Theron. We'll go with that. She is incredible. Her performance in Monster, her new film Tully, she's beyond ridiculous. Great. She's beautiful fat, she's beautiful skinny, she's beautiful period. She's just, she's got layers. She's got so much to work with. Oh my god. She's, she's bottomless pit of talent. Bottomless <laughs> of talent. I've looked at her abyss. <laughs> Glenn, it's been an amazing 20 plus minutes with you today. Wait a minute, you don't have more questions? I do, but... Okay. Well, get, get, ask me the question, you, like your gun and run question, like what you would have asked BJ Swallows at the very end. You know that insult question that you get in at the end? You've got to have one. Some dirt. No, I don't have any dirt. I couldn't find any dirt on you. Yeah, there isn't. I tried. I tried. I'm chased. I tried. Uh, what is the best film you've seen all year? How about that? These are the questions that, if the other questions go too fast, what is the best film you've seen all year? Wow, I've seen quite a few already that I think are great. Uh, Loveless, which was the Academy Award nominated Russian film for foreign language film, mm -hmm. uh, I saw it right at the beginning of the year. Phenomenal. Depressing as hell. Would make a good double bill with the movie Tully, which comes out in a couple of weeks. Yeah. With Charlize Theron. Also, depressing as hell, but wonderful. It's like very surprising and interesting. Have so you seen Tully? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's very, very mm -hmm. good. Uh, surprising. And you, anyone who's going to go see it, don't read any reviews, don't know anything about it. You really don't want anything. Yeah. To, you don't, just want to watch that film fresh. Yeah, I don't read any reviews. Don't. Especially None. with that one. Because I have movie pass and I don't need to because it's all free anyway. <laughs> No, but so far it's been a great year, and it's early. It has been a great year. Yeah. It's great. I just went to go see uh, Blockers last night. I'm seeing that tomorrow. So funny. Go see Blockers. Cock Blockers. Hysterical. I Hysterical heard, I heard it's funny. I loved it. And I saw The Quiet, uh, Quiet Space, or Quiet House, or whatever the Quiet it's Place. Great. Amazing film. Can we talk Amazing. about a logic issue with that movie, though? Go ahead. Okay. And I don't want to spoil anything. I'm just going to say that you're in the apocalypse. You got aliens invading Earth. You can't make a sound. No. You're, you're two responsible parents with children. And so when you're traveling from point A to point B, why do you let your little child walk behind you? I know. Why do you, why do you get pregnant? I, <laughs> there are a lot of things in that film. After I watched it, I was like... Um, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, yet it no. is a bare-knuckle ride. It's an amazing film. From beginning to end. It's I, I, great I, I suspense. I highly recommend yeah. it. Awesome. I, I watched it. I couldn't stop it. After I was walking home, I was like, hmm. Then my brain started working. But the last time I was shaken by a film, because that movie shook me, mm -hmm. was Aliens, the sequel, <gasps> right? I yeah. was so shaken by that film. I saw it in Toronto. I was working on a movie there. And I saw the movie, and it's the only movie I've ever done this, where I left the theater and went right back in and saw it again. Really? Like, I was so excited by the filmmaking. So and good. It was so unnerving, and I hadn't had that feeling until A Quiet Place. Yeah. Now, and, and to John Krasinski's credit, he knows how to make suspense. He knows how to create intense <sighs> yeah. moments. And the whole cast is really good, too. Yeah, very good. And they don't really speak. They don't speak. It's a quiet place. Yeah, they have to be quiet, which is amazing because also what it does is it forces today's audiences, which who are always talking and texting, mm -hmm. to lean forward in their seat and not make a sound. Yeah, it's the, it's the best antidote to all of that crap. Yeah, it is really good. It's excellent. Glenn. Yeah, Mike Pingle. It's been amazing. What would be more amazing and challenge your viewers? What? He he needs a theme song. Someone write this guy a theme song. I do need a theme song. I yeah. Do. 
Like just, something seventies. Like, do you know too many cooks? That parody on YouTube? No, I don't. It's a, it's a sitcom parody. That's the the entire parody is this endless theme song, and the introduction of each cast member. And What's there are, it there are hundreds of cast members in this non-existent sitcom. Yeah, and it's just. Too many cooks. You'll see. You'll see it, and you'll know too what I mean. Too many cooks. I'm if writing this down. you love '70s style sitcoms, you will love Too Many Cooks. I don't know what you're talking about. I hate '70s. '70s was horrible. Horrible years. <laughs> no good TV came out of it. <laughs> None. 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 <laughs> Charlie's Angels. Pfft, who cares? Uh, everybody, thank you for watching today. All in the family can go f itself. <sighs> they right? did. Yeah. That, that whole family were incestuous with each other. It was just gross. Gross. But I'm interrupting your outro. Go. I'm just trying to leave. I'm just trying to say goodbye to everybody. But we can keep talking. And the camera will turn off again. No, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> when my guest says he has to go, it's time for me to wrap up the show. Thank you for watching the Mike Pingle Show. I'm Mike Pingle, of course. And Glenn Gaylord. I heard he likes to be touched like this. <laughs> I do. I do like to be touched. And BJ's. BJ's everywhere. Um, uh, thank you for watching. Please share with your friends, neighbors, and of course your enemies. Because you know what? Hey! They want to watch the show too. Um, check back next Thursday for a brand new show. It's true. And maybe I'll have contacts so you won't have rings in my eyes throughout the show. Um, thanks for watching. Bye now.